Hello and welcome to Cherry Stem number 14. What is postmodernism and so can you? Uh, that is a joke title, um, obviously. Poking fun at the silliness of postmodernism. But in all seriousness, um, as much as we can muster, this show will be about postmodernism and how it very directly ties into the SJW culture and by extension, the more radical fringes of feminism and some of the histrionic type behaviors we have seen in the feminist uh, spheres. And I have my co-host Richard Rall with me today and I am Anna Cherry. And if you guys would like to hang out with us after this broadcast and talk more in depth about any of the topics we cover today or anything else, uh, we'll be doing a, a video chat uh, for patrons after the broadcast. So like a little bit of an after show, after party. And you can uh, definitely join the Honey Badger Ken on my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Anna Cherry. Um, and there is a way to get into our post hangouts through the Badger Patreon as well. So look into that um, if you want to support Badgers as well as us. There's two different Patreons. Uh, one is Honey Badger Radio for the Badgers, and one is Anna Cherry for uh, us specifically, since we are here on a volunteer basis. And after that little bit of a spiel, um, we can get into it. And what I have for you guys prepared today is a bit of a history uh, on postmodernism, or rather, in order to understand postmodernism, you need to understand modernism. So we're going to be talking a little bit about both. And we're going to try to keep it concise and fun. And I will pull up the chat at some point so I can uh, keep an eye on you guys' questions if you have any. And also, I'm just going to say, basically, this is kind of a uh, know thy enemy. And there will be like kind of a I'm going to I'm going to try to point out some of the baby and bathwater. It's you know, there's I think it's predominantly bathwater at this point, but there is some uh, something valuable in this uh area of philosophy i know that, that some people that are in this audience may you know kind of see the whole philosophy thing as just as as garbage and uh and there's good reason to, to see it that way because and we're going to be pointing out a lot of reasons to see especially specifically postmodernism as a big pile of garbage but there are, i also want to point out some of the things that are valuable and uh, and so i'll be uh, doing that uh, at some point as well you'll be doing a bit of a devil's advocate at times exactly I mean, the way I have it set up, um, the, the way I will be describing what is postmodernism in relation to modernism, uh, there will be, I will cover um, things about it that may not be bad, or rather understanding why there was a pushback against modernism that created postmodernism. And at this point, I have really come to understand that with a little bit of help from Noam Chomsky, but that that everything um, that happens is sort of a um, what is the word I'm looking for? The um, not pushback, but um, oh yeah, it's a sort of response, a, ba a backlash. Backlash, that's yeah. the word. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's um, it, there will be. It, what's interesting is to see how these philosophies tie into science, how they tie into uh, even mathematics, and I'm, I'm going to get into that with um, you know uh, Kurt Gödel, and uh, and it goes back to Kant. But I'm going to let you uh, start with you, you know, some of the information you had put together. I was really liking what you were showing me, and uh, so I'd like to hear what you what you put together. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I mean, just as you were saying, the. the <laughs> trying to pull up the chat uh, while we're um, talking here, but uh, yeah. So what I'm what, what I did is I kind of will will give you guys a bit of uh, my background on it as well as um, a bit of a history on uh, modernism, postmodernism, and yeah. Just as you said, the idea of um, the backlash is is something that is fi figuring prominently my understanding of things, uh, of history. Well, well, we are here today in the world that we are here in today because of history, because of everything that has happened before that has led us here. So it is really a, a new way for me to look at history as a series of backlashes. So um, the prominent example that Chomsky gave was with the civil rights movement, and then there was a backlash uh, or rather, there was, uh, you know, a lack of civil rights. And then there was a really strong backlash to that with the civil rights um, fights and, you know, marches and people being very liberal as a backlash to being conservative. And then there was a conservative backlash in response to that and things tightened up again. And we had like the 
Vietnam War and other issues. And then, and then in response to that conservatism, there was a backlash of liberalism. And so we just keep going these waves, these backlashes back and forth. And we keep going between uh, a, a liberal and a conservative sort of, uh, there's, uh, I think Alison sort of mentioned this, but there's the, the status quo, sort of the anchor, um, uh, that is the conservatism and the, the the progress to push forward that is the liberalism but in this case we have we can almost see them as uh, a boat or something that keeps flipping uh, and or, or something that has two sides uh, like a buoyo buoyo how do you buoyo how do you say that <laughs> word <anymore>? <laughs> <laughs> a little buoy boy. Oh boy, <laughs> the thing that floats. And so on the top, you have like the red and the blue, right? So you have uh, the conservatism, for instance, is the status quo. And then you have a liberal backlash undercurrent that then flips it over. And then you have the liberal, uh, which kind of reigns, which we currently saw for the past, you know, a, a few, uh, eight to 10 years, I guess. And then now we have this, this alt-right Trump backlash to it. So over and over, we have this sort of uh, flow and I find it really interesting to see things from that perspective because it really works that way. And we will see this um, shown very prominently in postmodernism and modernism relationship. Now, back to what you said about philosophy. I really like uh, that um, little quote or, or um, anecdote, or I don't know if it's the right word for it, but it was, I think an anecdote is the right word, but I think you know what I'm talking about. There was, um, there's a lot of context between the two of us that I'm like using keywords to talk to you to try to get some of the things I don't remember. <laughs> so you can help me. Well, at this point, I'm not following. So I, I'm, I'm crowdfunding you uh, for information. But no, I'm talking about that little uh, anecdote that went, um, you know, why do you need philosophy? Like it's, you know, you need science to like understand what everything is, but then you need philosophy to understand, you know, you know what I'm talking about, that little thing? And yeah, you know, I'm 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 drawing a blank here. Oh, okay. uh, well, I don't know. Was a, how, how about how about the a quote from uh, um, uh, what's his name? Um, it wasn't anybody's quote. It was just like a little <laughs> anecdote. Okay, okay. I don't I don't know what we're talking. Sorry. About. Well, I'm sorry, guys. This would it would have been better if you were there. <laughs> you, had be. you had been there. Um, yeah. This is this is great radio here. But um, no, it's it's a little anecdote that basically, in a clever way, shows you that philosophy is an understanding of everything. Like you need, you know, science to understand how things work. Like in like you need physics to understand how like you know physical things work, and then you need like medicine to understand like how people work or whatever. But then you need philosophy to understand what any of those things are. It's like going back to bill clinton's like what is what does is what is is you know <laughs> like what is is mean uh that sort of thing is is philosophy so on one hand you see it as uh completely ridiculous like uh, splitting hairs and and defining you know things that are well, it comes down to like epistemology. I mean, there there are the, a part of this. Okay, what you what you're basically looking at is there is rebellion and there is status quo, and there is you know you have to have something to to believe in, something to move forward, some plan that you have to follow. And you can't always just be tearing apart your plans. And so, but the thing is, you also sometimes your plan is crap, and so you have to be able to tear apart your plans. And so there's the these the, that's the two kind of opposing forces that that we're talking about here. And sometimes that's what philosophy and specifically critical theory and these. So you're actually kind of talking along the lines of what postmodernism, you know, kind of was attempting to do and became, um, it basically, it, it turned in on itself and became uh, too, it went too far in that direction. So the, the like, for instance, critical theory, it's, it's about doubting, uh, you know, your axioms, where you, these things that you take for granted. And, you know, and truthfully, that's, that's, that's what science is supposed to be about as well, is you're supposed to sit there and say, okay, we take these things for granted. And, you know, the back, it used to be that, well, we knew that, you know, meat produces worms, you know, it's just, you don't have to think beyond that. That's it. That's the bottom level. We know that meat produces, uh, you know, worms. It just does it spontaneously. Uh, and, but then somebody has to go in and say, yeah, okay, that is true, but maybe there's a in-between point. And so there has to be some sort of criticism. There has to be some sort of criticism of your axioms, of, of your assumptions. Of, and that is the uh, kind of the the good part of what it is that um, postmodernism was supposed to kind of be about. And that's and when you go with the, the kind of where it really started with, uh, with Kant, then uh, that is kind of what he was getting at. And specifically, um, he, he was, he was attempting to, to say, okay, what was, what was the name of his, um, 
uh, I think it was, yeah, the, a, a Kant's critique of pure reason. And, uh, and that, that extends into Gödel, which by the way, I, I always call him Godel, but it's actually Gödel. And, you know, I was pronouncing, I pronounced his name wrong forever and nobody ever corrected me. And so now I've got a habit of calling him Godel instead of Gödel. But anyways, Gödel. Mathematicians, they have to have weird names. It's it's, it's, a, it's I think a, there's some sort of rule. It's an umlaut, isn't it? It's like yes, an umlaut yes. and like Swedish names, so it's probably it's like good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's something like that. Um so, and uh well, exactly. And so when you when you get into there are certain aspects of philosophy that are you know there is a philosophy to science like uh, 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 Descartes um, quote if you would be a real seeker of truth it is necessary that at least once in your life uh, you doubt as far as possible all things and uh, and so that is a you know a, a good axiom to go by but that can go too far and I'm going to use a quote from uh, one of my favorite uh, movies uh, Ghost in the Shell and it's once you start doubting, there's no end to it uh, and so the point is that there is a point at which you can literally tear apart your own consciousness you can destroy your ability to think rationally at all and in you know if you could look, just look at the name of the you know the beginning work to postmodernism which is you know uh, that the a, a critique of pure reason you can see how that could go terribly wrong if taken too far um, so uh, anyhow I, I think we've started to bunny trail a little bit and I think you kind of had a specific plan of where you were going and so a few things that you wanted to cover directly so let's get on that to wrap up what you basically just said to kind of uh uh condense it uh what you're trying to say is that their philosophy can go terribly wrong but there is initially a reason why they start heading in that awfully wrong direction that it ends up being right it is there, there is a there's a reason for rebellion and i think everybody has both that liberal and that conservative aspect to them if we want to break it down to those kind those labels and that is that we have this holding the line and holding the center and going with the plan and and you know and trying to move forward with that but then we also have the rebellion the the you know screw that screw you know, i'm doing something different i'm trying something new i'm going around i'm finding a new way and so i think we all have those two kind of opposing forces in us and so that of course we find those opposing forces forces in society and finding some sort of balance between them is important and and you can see that this this is applicable to a variety of things and it happened specifically in philosophy but now postmodernism is that's it's how it went wrong it's how rebellion turns into chaos and and, and this is kind of on the mental plane is what happened with postmodernism is the rebellion which was healthy yeah, turned into chaos and a complete destruction of any structure at all whatsoever. And so in, instead of instead of simply pruning a structure, it's cutting it off at the root. Uh, and uh, and that's that's you know what we're going to get in, into here. Yes. Um, sorry, I'm trying to pay attention to chat while also uh, your verboseness and this. I'm having a hard time with both, so I'm not really sure what to do here. Verbosity. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, Okay, so uh, I did have kind of a um, scaffolding for, for the show, and uh, we already went uh, a little far, I think, in some topics, but uh, sorry, we'll just circle back around to them. Um, so the whole thing that we're kind of dealing with right now in, on a lot of college campuses and the reason why postmodernism is a problem, et cetera, et cetera, is because we're having a rhetoric versus a dialectic. That, that's kind of the issue that is happening. Um, and what those are, are methods of arguing, so to speak, or they're methods of achieving truth. So a rhetoric is where you use um, more manipulative-like um, beha behaviors or tools, such as appeal to emotion, um, a, a way to sway someone or convince them. It's a more uh, persuasive sort of thing that you're doing. So you're employing not just reason, but emotion and a variety of other, um, you know, things that affect people uh, versus a dialectic, which is a strictly using logic and facts to arrive to a truth. So um, a dialectic is currently not allowed at all whatsoever. Um, nobody is willing to engage on that level. And uh, in fact, in many places, uh, science and facts are deemed as um, they trigger people. They are deemed as uh, sexist, racist, um, like trying to shut down dialogue or, or, or whatever. Uh, so people don't want to engage uh, with 
others on a dialectic sort of uh, level, but everyone really very much wants to use their opinions and their experience, the, the lived experience, which I very much use <laughs> the, both the expression lived experience and the, you know, the, the use of it for uh, explaining to people that there are things that happen to humans, they go through issues, they have lived experiences, but at the same time, you interpret your lived experience. And so when you focus yeah. on nothing but that, go ahead. I was just gonna say, so you, it basically they, what they've done is taken this idea uh, of of tearing uh, you know down the um, basically a hierarchy of any value. In other words, the the basis of 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 their arguments is that you know one experience and one idea is just as good as any other. And uh, and so there is the they by trying to create this equality of ideas, uh, which is specifically it's it's anti science, of course. Um, then you know th then of course you, you're how can you not give just as much time to, you know, people talking about the sky made of bana bananas as somebody, you know, trying to tell you why the sky is blue having to do with light, et cetera. They're both, they're both equal, you know, it is basically the, the, that is the, the cancerous offshoot of the of uh, critiquing reason is that there becomes an equivalence of ideas. There is no longer a hierarchy uh, or value of ideas, and so that is kind of the basis of of that whole uh, argument that you're you're stopping them from 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 talking because you know they have just as much right to give their idea because it has just as much value because it's theirs. And so there's uh, there's you know something something there. So right, and I'll I'll go into why that happened or like how did we arrive at that to, at that point now um, because a lot of it very directly has to do with the relationship between modernism and, and of course postmodernism being a critique of modernism and um, a lot of it just really goes back to the enlightenment and as somebody mentioned in the chat um, are we going to talk about the uh, that there is a difference between science, which is a methodology, versus um, scientism, which is an ideology, and this is this is a little bit of what we're talking about here. So we'll we'll go into that a little bit because um, the Enlightenment, uh, the modernist uh, movement, was a uh, it applied applied um, it employed scientific methodology and applied I guess scientific methodology, but it also had a sci scientism kind of uh, was an ideology that was associated with it as well. So it was both. And then postmodernism kind of went in there and was like, yeah, no, we don't like your scientism because of these reasons. And I'll, I'll list those reasons. So um, the reason I care about postmodernism or wish it gone is because I am a uh, academic, so to speak. I, I did go to college and I try to earn a degree and I did earn a degree. Um, and I would like to pursue other scientific biology, neuroscience, psychology type of things. Uh, so, you know, pretty hard sciences, most of them. And what bothered me was that a lot of the scientific avenues or classes and subjects that were considered uh, as more of a, a, a pure science um, started becoming about like opinions. And that's exactly what postmodernism is. That's one of the issues with postmodernism. You can't really get a definition of it. Um, and they like it that way. But uh, my personal anecdote was that I went to an anthropology class and the description of it, I wish I remembered the title of the class because it was kind of important to the whole thing. And it sounded like something very interesting, something about like, you know, cultures and figuring out what, why they do what they do. Like, I don't know, something that I would really be interested in. And then, um, and I needed it for my general requirement. And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? This sounds good. And the first thing the professor says when we sit down is that uh, the title of the class is a bit misleading. But I did it, he basically clickbaited us. He did it on purpose. Um, and the entire class was basically postmodernism 101. It ended up being a discussion of, you know, opening up spaces for discourse among different cultures. And, you know, just because you think that water boils in a microwave at a certain degree uh, and altitude, uh, you know, to the indigenous peoples of wherever, it uh, it's actually the god of water that's boiling that, that, that water in the cup and in, in the microwave there. So your um, understanding of the science behind it is no more valid than their understanding of the god of water that's you know equally 
equally valid and useful, you know, uh, approaches right. there. Because the truth is is determined by what the social environment, uh, you know, says it to be. And see, that's the thing is they they've confused the idea that what people's what people think is truth, how people get their idea of truth, does come from a social context, from a consensus, from their from guessing what it is that they think that everybody believes. That is accurate. However, that is not an actual any kind of underlying truth but kind of most of the people in most postmodernism don't believe there is anything below the level of that social idea of truth and so that's how they end up thinking that it's like well okay that's their social socially constructed idea of truth and so that's no more valid than our socially uh, um, um, idea of truth and you know and we're just being you know uh, ridiculous in, in and uh, an uppity about our you know, our social constructs and, you know, we should recognize that it's just a social construct. And so it's like, okay, well, it's a, that, that is accurate to a certain extent that it is not perfectly flawless, that it is a social construct, our idea of what is possibly true. But then we also know that there is something below that, that we're trying to describe. And we know that there's a separation between what we're trying to describe and what and and the description and that's the the thing that they lose is any kind of division between the, you know that which is being described and the description and so uh so that's that's where um uh, that that idea that they that they get that it's like oh their their social truth is just as good as ours it's like well you know because their culture how, how can you say your culture is superior that's just you know that's uh i don't know arrogant or whatever <laughs> Right. That's and, and we'll get a lot more into that because that's really at the core of I mean, that is basically postmodernism is uh, saying that opinions and truth. Well, truth is um, dependent on opinions and that opinions change uh, what truth is. Um, they define rather what truth is. And that's the big rift and something that I find unacceptable to be in academia, in sciences, in actually everywhere. Uh, postmodernist thinking is something that is associated with more relativism. It is part of the, it is kind of part of the same ball. And in fact, I think that it was um, a relativity theory and then later more relativism. And then from there, we actually arrived at postmodernism. And uh, it was actually a while we had the main um, flourishing scientific revolution happening uh, along in, in things like biology and chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, alongside it, we were having a very magical sort of, um, I don't know what a better word for it is, but a very much your perception defines reality sort of approach to physics with the a lot of the special relativity and then some of the elements of quantum. Right. And I'll, I'll, I'll get into specifically where the, those tie together because it's, you, you, it's a very, very fine line and it has to do with interpretation. It's not, it, you know, there is data that is, you know, pretty much unequivocal, but then the way that you interpret the data can, you can be either with a magical non-mechanical mindset or it can be with a mechanical idea of reality. And so the, you right. know, basically the difference between how you view reality, it comes down to whether or not you believe in magic or you believe in mechanics. Uh, that's kind of a you know a, a basic scientific principle, but it's it, it is you know philosophical at its heart. Yes, and that is what we kind of started facing uh, the the rift that kind of happened in the beginning of the twenty first century. Um, and I think I personally believe that in the nineteen oh five was it uh, um, 1912 that period between there um we had a new uh, a pushback a uh, backlash we had a postmodernist sort of um approach uh, an interpretation using relativistic attitudes uh, using um well basically relativity theory it kind of uh supported okay so you have this 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 pushback against rational thinking and right. then relativity theory comes in and basically it started to be used as proof it's just like um you know the uh uh, some of the aspects of quantum physics, the way that it's interpreted, people use this as a way as to leverage their philosophy that, um, you know, that, that you basically think things, you know, you think existence into occurring. And I mean, 
uh, and it's and, and that it, here's the thing is that that postmodernism is the dominant philosophy of liberal arts college and uh, and it is based in, in understanding that these are the roots that it comes from that it comes from uh, these basic critiques and so like the the points at which the the they find justification in the sciences for this ideology are specifically you know starting with Kant is not the, the that is a the um, um, the point, okay, so Kant's philosophy and Gödel's uh, incompleteness theorem are basically the same thing expressed in two different ways. And, uh, and Gödel's incompleteness theorem, basically it just shows that uh, there are, and, and here's the thing where it, you know, it, it, it's a good idea to have some, some reading. Bring us back on track first a little oh, bit? Oh, sure, go ahead. Uh, yeah, we could talk about science more. I, I didn't mean to launch us off into there just yet. Um, it is just something, um, I am setting up this for later, but in, in in my opinion, that is basically what started happening is we started having a scientific uh, approach that was valuing non-mechanical interpretation that happened with special relativity and then from there on because of the interpretation of a lot of the quantum data. and. It's just the thing is that people are going to like the uh, people who that's, that is their social truth. And so for, therefore they're going to be losing their mind until we explain this very, very specific idea of, of why that is. And so it's, uh, uh, that's why I was trying to, to get to that point as quickly oh, as possible, okay. because when you start yeah, criticizing right. something that is widely accepted in science, people lose their fucking minds. So uh, you, know, it's, <laughs> you, it, you have to, it, we have to get specifically to that. If we're going to, we're going to say that, you know, we have to get to it pretty quickly. Well, uh, if, if you guys are interested in hearing that, definitely uh, foam at the mouth for a little longer because we will definitely cover a lot of this because um, I have, the way I have set things up, I have like a video that leads into it and things like that, but um, I'll, I'll just drop it for now. And, and uh, Yes, that's um, a good idea. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I didn't have anything to say other than what I already said, which was basically that um, there is a way in which you can once a dominant philosophy, even in science and in interpretation of physics, once a dominant philosophy becomes something that is not based on mechanics because of a critical thing that happened in the interpretation of the theory, there is a removal of a critical thing that made things mechanical. And after that, it stopped being mechanical. And that is kind of the new wave of the 21st century. It was a new attitude. It was what everyone was sort of feeling inspired by and they were kind of looking at the world in a non-mechanical way and so from there we kind of have that everything is relative every truth is yeah. relative right exactly. that exactly. is the, that is the ex extending that full that idea found in relativity to a philosophical uh and fuzzier domain uh and same, believing that uh, every truth is relative everything is relative and that there is no solid singular you know uh, thing that is that has any greater value than another or anything that can be just that anything that can be uh that is a kind of a, a measuring stick or that other things can be judged by exactly because i mean we got to the point for christ's sake where we we're trying to find a god particle in quantum physics so i mean we clearly are bridging philosophy with physics so you know if anyone's foaming at the mouth about the you can't possibly have any relationship between a physics theory and in the way that impacted philosophy or the world or that's ridiculous because at the very root of it it is also a way of understanding reality which is philosophy and so what we're i'm leading up to this modernism postmodernism issue of begin to understand modernism to understand postmodernism and um before you we even get into that that's probably the best definition of postmodernism that's why i'm doing that because it's really really hard to find an actual definition of modern uh, postmodernism and postmodernists like it that way and uh, i actually have a little bit of a video here that i want to present um it's a, a quick little quote um uh, sorry guy for the facial expression i paused on but uh, um, this is basically the, the definition of, of postmodernism. There, there isn't one, really. History. We realized that postmodernism as a, as a reaction to modernism or humanism um, has gotten so broad, so ambiguous, that there's nothing we can hang our hat on. It is truly everybody determines their own purpose, their own meaning, their, mo their own ethics, their own belief system. And who am I? to say that any of those individual components. I forgot I have to stop it so that it doesn't give me trouble. And so that worldview are in any way incorrect or wrong. 
if you've experienced them, if they mean something to you, if you've felt them personally, then they're true. That's postmodernism at its core. Right. So that, that is postmodernism at its core. Uh, and what to understand postmodernism, uh, you need to understand modernism. And basically, what we're having is an industrial revolution. We're having enlightenment. Uh, these traditions of you know in, uh, reason and logic and all that good stuff. And um, you know, uh, a lot of people didn't like that because <laughs> there was a glorifying of logic, a reason. You had Descartes with I think, therefore I am, and that got associated with a lot of very materialistic things. And so people started seeing a departure of the spiritual. They started to see their world become anti-spiritual, become fully materialistic. And um, you had this idea that um, it's called Cartesian anxiety, Descartes. This was Cartesian as part of his last name. And uh, it's something that postmodernists use in order to uh, sort of make fun of or to denigrate uh, people who are interested in logic and reason by saying that they have this Cartesian anxiety. They just, you know, will not leave them alone until they understand something. They're just tormented uh, with this anxiety that uh, we will not let them be uh, until they understand the world. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, they actually talk about these, you know, they, they, they pose it as these lesser minds that have to make up some story of reality as if there is, you know, one moment leading to the next. And it's just, it's just ridiculous that these poor little minds have to, you know, have this storyline about, you know, reality and, uh, you know, and that things, you know, have any kind of, and you can tell that there's this, this, this um, denigration of any kind of hierarchy, any kind of, you know, even just cause and effect, that idea of cause and effect, well, that's just Cartesian anxiety. And, uh, and it's funny, but, you know, I, I kind of see the, you, you can, I, I'm sure some of you are probably recognizing some of the things that we're talking about here, and, and you're seeing it just everywhere, because this postmodernism in its more raw form of, uh, of just everybody's, uh, you know, absolutely right, even no matter how ridiculous they are. Um, it, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's like a mind virus that is destroying people's consciousness. They can't, they, they can no longer think because I mean, it really does tend to break down. It breaks down their ability to, to even rationally, you know, put anything together. And I, I'll get into some specifics about that in just a second. Yeah, and uh, that's actually one of the things that, um, since we're talking about Cartesian anxiety, if you guys are familiar with that term, there is a another term called the frick f flickering light, um, which is a lot of the modernist uh, authors, which is Elliot Joyce, uh, Virginia Woolf, um, they, in some of their writings, there's a flickering light that um, pr is prominent, and because the idea is that it, the reason, the logic, is this light, and uh, you know we strive towards this flickering light, but it's been also associated with Cartesian anxiety. So this flickering light, Cartesian anxiety. There's a anxious sort of um, theme uh, in it that postmodernists like to level against modernists. And so what we basically had is modernism, which was a complete well, I don't want to call it faith, but a complete faith in logic and reason. It's, it's sort of a, a way in which it was a philosophy of the day. It was what, you know, industrial revolution, et cetera, people decided to do. They were like, we can achieve progress and we can go forth through logic and, and reason. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, but it was also very strongly associated with rationalism and capitalism and um, universality sort of came into being around this time as well. And this, we're at uh, World War II era at this point, um, 50s or 60s or so, and we are having um, universality of there's uh, like maps being made about the world, there's you know people being tallied up and like censuses and things like that, and things were being very uh, systematized. Uh, they, they, were, they were being put into systems, into order, into, um, you know, the sort of very rigid, logic, reason-minded approach uh, to everything, to people, to everything. And so what postmodernists were doing, uh, people who became postmodernists, um, they were, all they were doing is just critiquing um, this modernism. They were they were pushing back against it, uh, and so you had, uh, which is interesting that they would even push back against uh, something that they saw modernism as like enlightened, like 
offshoot of enlightenment as something that is uh, logic, reason, hard, materialist, uh, capitalist, all the all those things. But we actually had people like Joyce, uh, who was a modernist, um, but his whole shtick was to be an avant-garde uh, experimenter and, you know, moving away from religious uh, from religion and from status quo and from things like that is what modernists were trying to do. They were trying to completely break with church and get rid of all types of superstitious things. And in that, in pursuit of that, they actually ended up doing a lot of experimental things. If you've read Finnegan's uh, Wake, you know, it's, it's an extremely experimental piece of work. So you would almost confuse, um, you know, Joyce for postmodernists. And uh, right now I had a- Yeah, there's some horseshoe theory there. <laughs> make sure that he isn't. Um, but, uh, you know, the postmodernists were like, yeah, these modernist guys are great and all, I guess, but not really because, you know, we actually, postmodernists do want, they don't, they don't, they didn't really like the secular, secular. But well, here's the thing. It's kind of like uh, the movie Gattaca. Uh, you know, there, there is this idea in Gattaca that you can just order everything. You can sit there and predict everyone's, you know, value by their genes. And, uh, and, and so I, I think most anyone, uh, regardless of how rigid and structured you like life can see that as a, as a critique of that idea that you can't just, you know, uh, you have to have competition bear out the truth of what is actually valuable and, and, and having everything planned and structured. Well, I mean, we, we see that, that that's uh, a, um, uh, when it comes to conservative values, conservatives do not like the idea of trying to plan out all of, uh, of the systems to such an extent that you're, you're controlling everything that you're talking about government control. And so there's, the, there's kind of, that's, that's the baby in the bathwater of postmodernism is, is, is saying that, well, these, these overly structured systems can lead to ruin. And, uh, and so that, that's the actual good aspect of it, that you, you can't just have these overly structured systems. Yeah. To quote, um, um, someone who I used to love, who broke my heart to quote Stoya, um, systems are good. Systems are terrible because you, you do need systems, but you also, uh, systems are, um, the, the, it is a, a prison that we sort of create um, for ourselves in a way. It is something that ends up being uh, constricting and confining and um, hurtful, like it, uh, oppressive, that's the word, not hurtful. Because um, hurtful, it, it, it evokes a very, like, ow, oh, my feels, <laughs> but you know, at the same time. You, you mean uh, damaging. Right, exactly. Oppressive, damaging, uh, you know, no good for happiness or freedom or anyone. So, you know, you do need systems. You, you do need to have a understanding of things, but you also have to be aware that it is uh, – rigidity is, is good when you're trying to give something form, but you got to also realize it's rigid. It's not flexible. It, it is a cell. It is a prison. It is what it is. So you need to be aware of its downsides as well as its positives. And that's basically what ended up happening with postmodernism. They saw Auschwitz. They saw the bomb, um, the nuclear, you know, test and weapon discharge. And they were like, well, fuck this. Uh, you know, science sucks. Uh, rationalism sucks. Um, all of this is terrible. So we need to, you know, go against it. So that was basically what happened is you you had um, uh, they they didn't think they, they actually okay first of all postmodernists um, they don't necessarily always call themselves that there's even kind of a um, it breaks down into structuralists and post structuralists such as Foucault like he uh, rejected the label as uh, post structuralist and postmodernist he rejected all the labels and he was like I'm just a, a critic of a history of modernity. So, you know, some some were like, I'm just a critic of modernism, but others, um, you know, took on labels such as structuralist, post-structuralist, post-modernist. And basically what they saw was that social forces and things like that are more important to creating an egalitarian society than reason and logic is. Um, and on top of that, they saw that a universal truth, and of course, yes, as uh, Paladin points out, Marxist and Freudian psychology was uh, influential, as well as uh, Auschwitz and the bomb. There were a variety of ways in which uh, people were acclimating to this modernist thing, and they were not liking what they were seeing. And even the concept of universal truth was seen as dangerous. Uh, in fact, postmodernists saw it as a fascist uh, 
approach of making everybody think the same way. And this is where, you know, you see a baby in the bathwater once again, because on one hand, uh, having a universal truth is important if it's the actual truth, like us trying to understand reality and to have some provable truth about reality that will be a universal truth. But we end up living in this world of opinions and emotions and people. And so whatever society decides is the truth ends up being the universal truth. And that's where we have problems. That's where we start. Uh, you know, that's where we end up today, where society thinks that women are victims at all times. And so we are basically in a very bad situation uh, because everybody's being taught a universal truth that is not actually real. So I can understand where postmodernists were coming from with that. Um, because it's a lofty goal to think that people are just going to be rational and actually believe the truth that is objectively the truth. Um, that's not reality, though. A lot of times people will just believe what the group around them believes. That becomes the de facto truth. So, um, you know, there is a bit but of a... There is a certain level of, of inability. It's like, okay, so even a person who believes themselves to be extremely rational and scientific, they have to believe in the fact that uh, other people aren't deceiving them. They have to believe that the other that the experiments that they've seen, that, that they've heard about, have actually been carried out and that it's not just all lies. And so there are, they, there are these sets of beliefs, these granted, you know, that they are just pure faith because you don't know for sure. You haven't specifically done every single test that humanity has ever done of any of all sciences and things like that that are that build up the the sciences that you believe in and so there there are these these levels of faith that are absolutely a requirement to simply progress as a as a normal conscious individual but uh the truth of the matter is some people be, you know look at even those normal levels of of faith and say, uh, should I doubt those? And and that's actually where it starts to break down. And that's why I just kind of want to to interject at that point because it's um, that is what happens is that there is a that there's a point at which you have to believe you know something. You have to you have to have some sort of belief, and you have to understand that 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 there is a faith that you have that is intrinsically flawed. That you have to believe, you know. And, and when it comes down to it, there is a there is a a, uh, a rational critique there is uh, of our of science that says that well you know that's why we use the term theory etc et is because it has to be open for further development because we because there's not the idea of an absolute certainty is is something that we feel comfortable with but that is kind of a human emotion that we that are that that, that kind of stands in the way of scientific progress uh, uh, repeatedly where we always end up you know having some set belief and that's how things like the you know the absolute truth that well well women are oppressed period that you know and how can you believe any different that's absurd i mean everybody knows this this truth and it's because they they have some uh, you 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 have to have some faith in the human beings around you to a certain extent that they have tested certain things out that they have looked at the data that they have and so you know the the there there are people who have these groups of of others around them that they're using because there's a level of humility that you have to have to say okay well you know I can't 100% rely on just my own experience of reality I have to have somebody looking at me and saying that I'm not crazy or that I'm not you know my my thinking isn't faulty that there is something you know there, there's there are some reliance upon that social truth that we all kind of have to deal with that is it is specifically there and so you know there is like like I said before kind of a baby in the bathwater that, that there is a uh, there is a social aspect to truth even scientific truth it's it, as a matter of fact there's a study of it called the you know the sociology of scientific belief and uh, and there are there the denying that that is there gives a strength to those faults in other words if you deny that you have a level of faith as a scientist then you grant some strength to those faults that any any one of those failure points becomes um, better able to survive because you're not critiquing it because you're not looking at it but there is a level of um there's a point at which critiquing something and go you you go to a level of paranoia and insanity once you start asking yourself are you a butterfly dreaming you're a man are you you know because those things you can sit there and, and doubt each one of those is everybody lying to me am i living in the truman show all these kinds of doubts 
are not particularly valuable. And that's the thing that it comes down to is being able to say, what is the point at which things are valuable to continue doubting? But uh, I, I'm, I think I'm kind of get, getting ahead of things, but I think it was just kind of important to sort of inject that at this point. Yeah, um, no, I, I definitely uh, appreciate you doing that because that's kind of the whole, that, that sums up what basically the, the issue is here. And, um, you know, we have the idea of uh, Leotard did um, meta-narratives is, is kind of what postmodernists or people who are critiquing modernism, they, they saw a danger in, you know, these uh, systems of truth. Uh, because, I mean, they saw Auschwitz and they were like, well, if you have a whole group of people who believes that the universal truth is that Jews are bad and they need to kill them, you know, like, what the hell is that sort of thing? Like, we need to make sure that we do not allow for somebody's opinion to be, that what they saw as somebody's opinion to be uh, end all and be all. Because for some people, for those who are, you know, basically postmodernist at their core, um, people who are slightly not in touch with the reality, to them, opinion is everything. So, you, and I mean, reality sort of mimics that sometimes you end up, a lot of times you end up having groups of people, societies, cultures that act on untruthful things. Like, I mean, let's look at religious cultures, you know. Um, they have an understanding of the truth as they see it, and it's a universal truth to them, and it leads to a lot of problems. So I can understand where postmodernists were coming from with that. Um, and uh, there was a danger in uh, legislating morality as they saw it, and in Leotard's meta narratives. Um, so uh, Leotard and other post structuralist thinkers like Foucault, um, Leotard was, um, he was critiquing meta narratives. He, he, he called these universal truths and ideas uh, meta narratives and criticized them as well. So he was a post-structuralist post -structuralist thinker like Foucault um, who viewed the destruction of meta narratives as a broadly positive development for a number of reasons. So, uh, first, um, uh, attempts to construct grand theories tend to unduly dismiss the naturally existing chaos and disorder of the universe, the power of the individual event, and things like that. And secondly, as well as ignoring the heterogeneity of variety of human existences, um, meta narratives are created and reinforced by power structures and are therefore untrustworthy. So this so it's basically, it's like eminent domain. It's like the you know the 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 Nazis thought that they were the basically the chosen people, just like other religious groups that thought that they're the chosen people and that God is on their side and that's why it's okay to you know murder and go go into people's land murder them and take all their shit because well you know that's what was intended by God and God wouldn't let the bad guys win and since we're winning we're obviously the good guys you know so that is the the you know uh, the the meta narrative that the, this is the this is the positive aspect of what he's talking about there yes uh, and so that's that's one sort of uh, way in which you know I can understand um, Postmodernism, because I, I do believe that humans are flawed in that sense, that, that there is no rational agent. But at the same time, uh, if you do not expect uh, better of yourselves and, and your people and your future generations, like if you do not strive towards something positive, even though you may be faulty right now, you may fail, but you have to strive towards logic and reason. And it's like, I'm, I'm really torn um, at, right here, right now at the crux of the, like the split between modernism and postmodernism, because on one hand, I very strongly believe in a mechanical, uh, you know, deterministic universe. But on the other hand, I do not believe in, and I've seen evidence of people, as a neuropsychologist, I do not believe in people's ability to be rational. So uh, it's like, with one half of me, I'm like, yes, we absolutely need objective truth because it absolutely exists. But on the other hand, I'm like, I sort of also don't trust humans to find what that truth is. Uh, or rather, uh, not necessarily to find it, but once you start legislating what truth is, because you you have you know these uh, monks almost these uh, the, the nerds the the seekers of truth you have them finding what reality is all about you finding what truth is in their you know little little hovel or wherever they're at little cave and they're they're working tirelessly on their one little thing and or one big thing and that's why how it's always been in science you have one man working you know on something really really important and I love that that is fantastic but then once it becomes a widespread truth for the masses that's when you start it, it becomes like 
uh, almost a game of telephone. It, it, it's uh, yes, ideas always mutate, and uh, therefore they, they, and then they become a cancer or a virus, or you know, they they end up becoming something different than uh, what they initially were. And I, I think that's kind of um, what happened with postmodernism, and I, th I think it happens with almost every religion as well. Where you know, if you go and you you try to read the 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 texts of these religions, you end up finding out that they've got this you know this uh, word of mouth. What's it called? Like uh, oral tradition that is like vast different than the text that they you know pretend is the be all and end all so it's like you know uh, it, 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 it's like these ideas even when they've got a text that they could refer back to they still end up changing it and they uh, and the truth of the matter is like for instance going back to you you're talking about uh, relativity I'm gonna bring that back up again is that there was a point in time at which um, relativity was no longer under the domain or opinion of Einstein and so people actually you know started talking and, and saying things that like well Einstein he didn't really understand relativity as well as we do now and that that's actually a very common belief as well and so there's you know there there's always this this idea that's like well you know as as it's uh, our our new idea as it's been uh you know as it's mutated well this is this is now better whereas it's not necessarily better it's simply mutated and uh, and many times it's it's crap uh because they don't actually have the same understanding as the as the originator yeah, and that's actually where we're sort of getting to my uh, bit about um, um, relativity here just a little bit because uh, what we ended up having from there is the destruction of science. So well, once you have uh, a critique of meta narratives, a uh, critique of universal truth, the next step is, uh, well, the purveyor of meta narratives and universal truth, which is science. So you had basically a destruction of science uh, is what I see it as. Um, and there was also kind of a, so postmodernism is a very wide thing. It's not just philosophy. It also was an art. It was in, like you saw, a movement away from secular, um, I mean, movement towards secular artwork away from the religious uh, because modernism started uh, invading other parts of life, um, not just philosophy. Like I said, uh, philosophy and, and other disciplines uh, are all in, intertwined because um, philosophy is an approach towards life. So it's it's kind of underneath all the well, other it ones. comes down to like for instance, even when you're doing math, the numbers by themselves mean nothing until you map them onto reality, until you're using them to solve a problem. When you're using them to solve a problem that has to do with your it, inductive uh, reasoning it has to do with the way that you map things and so therefore even though the math itself can be 100 percent correct you could be solving the word problem incorrectly and so there is a philosophical aspect to even math because it, when it, it's when it when it is applied that it then has the the human element in it and it has that inductive reasoning uh element in it where you're trying to you're trying to map things properly and you can screw it up and so um uh, you know, I, you know, and I'm not, I'm not sure exactly where I was going with that. <laughs> um, well, uh, there was a bit of um, a question earlier about um, me mentioning uh, Heidegger as one of the postmodernist uh, philosophers, and it's possible that he wasn't um, actually literally called a uh, postmodernist uh, philosopher, but. Um, the reason I mention him is because yes, he's a phenomenologist, which is phenomenology is kind of this the idea that uh, what I dealt with in my anthropology class. Um, it's a study of that which appears. So phenomenal, like phenomena. So you're studying. Oh, I, I know where I was going with that. It's specifically, that because philosophy is intertwined with science, that it is my opinion that the attack on science that was part of the postmodernist movement uh, has been successful to a certain extent. In other words, that because the philosophy that underlies mathematics, that underlies uh, the sciences, is philosophical to so, some extent, it is a weak point that can be attacked by other philosophies. And I think that postmodernism has infected science to a certain extent, and I'm going to uh, bear that out in this show. It's the specific points at which I believe postmodernist philosophy led to certain failure points in the interpretation of data. Well, it's perfect because that's so we're in our second hour now, so we should we'll um, we'll do that in just a minute because uh, that's pretty much well, what I have um, left here is yeah. The reason I mentioned Heidegger back to the chat thing is um, uh, phenomenology, the way at least it was presented to me. Um, I very easily lump Heidegger in with postmodernist uh, approach 
it doesn't matter that he didn't label himself that or nobody labeled him that, but all the quotes and all the ways in which we approached Heidegger in the anthropology, quote unquote, anthropology class was that uh, he talked about opening space for discourse and to allow other opinions in. So the whole shtick of, you know, understanding of phenomena of consciousness that Heidegger was doing had to do with valuing everybody's opinion equally to everybody else's, that nobody's uh, opinion is more important than anyone else's and that it's your duty to open space for discourse and, you know, invite them in and uh, all of that stuff. So, you know, there was, uh, there is also some uh, association between Heidegger and Derrida and Derrida was definitely postmodernist. So to me, the phenomenology or at least the way Heidegger approached it is very directly tied into postmodernism in the way that postmodernism uh, is approached or the way it plays out, which is you talk about needing to open space for discourse and to understand other people through their experiences and, and all that good stuff. Uh, but basically what we are at right now is um, we ended up having a backlash. Uh, this this postmodernist uh, idea was a backlash to a more conservative modernist um, thing. And so you used to have, you know, stonings and uh, other terrible things for, for gays or for, you know, others that were not seen as like blacks or whatever, you know, whatever disenfranchised group there was that uh, was being abused um, that was happening, you know, during more rigid times. And so the postmodernism was a backlash to a more rigid time, to a more religious time. And they were like, okay, well, let's not stone anyone. Let's just be super chill about everything. And so um, they also talked about the limitless instability of words. Uh, so the best part to me really about postmodernism is that postmodernists want to logically argue that logic doesn't work. And so they, they use a lot of words to tell you that there's a limitless instability of words. And uh, in a lot of uh, sort of postmodernist uh, ideas, they, they, um, not, they don't counter their own ideas, but it's like the things they believe in make their beliefs pointless. A lot of the, yeah, it, it, the, the the funny thing is is this goes directly into what I was talking about, which is uh, Girdle's incompleteness theorem, I mean, it, and and it goes back to the idea of this statement is false. So yes. you know the, there is a paradoxical nature, and that is actually uh, tied up in this philosophy is the, this paradoxical nature that there is a, uh, a that, that there is uh, problems with words and how we interpret them and the and the amount of information that's packed into a word and how much context you're using so there's a variety of things that are that are uh, valid critiques but if i can take off from this point um were you uh done with what you were doing uh, almost i just have one last thing uh, which is that um basically what i'm seeing at this point is that uh postmodernists and why it's destroying has destroyed science so much is because they are a form of a, a luddite type um, that believes that science is destructive and that, uh, you know, you need to pull back away from the destructive power of science. So um, I have one more thing to play here, which is uh, hopefully will lead right into what you're saying here. So the bomb eased their, uh, uh, what is it, <laughs> their Cartesian anxiety. Yes. by the media, where morality and knowledge could be defined and understood by the modernist, the postmodernist said neither could be defined and all was subjective. Rather, I gotta make sure I stop it every 20 seconds. Like Einstein's theory of relativity, everything was relative to the postmodernist and nothing could be ever concreted. Everything was moving within each other and there was no right or single answer. Where the main critique of the modernist movement was the bourgeois society, the main critique of the postmodernists were the modernists, for they argued that the modernists had a fascist way about them, which legitimized the idea that control belonged to the hands of the few. Or and so yeah, here, I think you gotta, uh, yeah, you gotta yeah. add something uh, in, in between. Yeah, and uh, here's where we basically have the definition of, or rather, a way in which postmodernism is directly SJW culture. It is the same, one in the fucking same. Although it all seemingly promised liberation at the end of it, new influences in the postmodernist movement were writers such as Nietzsche, Derrida, and Heidegger. Again, influenced by Marxism. Okay, she's she's getting off point, but um. 
Yeah, and, and Nietzsche, by the way, uh, they claim him, but uh, he wouldn't necessarily claim himself as a, a postmodernist because I, I and I personally looking at it, uh, I think that they're trying to uh, draw on Nietzsche as a uh, as postmodernist, but I don't think that he actually fits well in that, you know, with that label. Well, that's, that's all I pretty much had, just the idea that, um, you know, there is a everything is relative, uh, much like theory of relativity. That's that is something that right it's absolutely bad. used as one of the uh the uh, points on which that they uh, they uh you know have a scientific basis for their philosophical bent and uh and so yeah so so starting from there one so where did i want to go from here all right so uh so it started at, at Kant's critique of pure reason and that is girdle's incompleteness theorem so girdle's incompleteness theorem is a mathematical proof that logic can be broken and it basically kind of boils down to this sentence is false and you can do that in mathematics so that the math breaks itself because there are in formal logic systems anyway and so the, the point is that that you know you can take anything that is a formal logic system and break it in a certain way and in uh, uh, Douglas Hofstadter's book uh, Girdle Escher and Bach he, he kind of pointed out that you can that there's no matter how good of a record player you could make there's always some record that could that uh, that somebody could then make that was good at breaking record players. In other words, it was like the, where the it would cause it to shake apart. And there's actually this this did happen in uh, uh, the early days of computing. There were actually viruses that would cause the hard drive to resonate at a, at a frequency which would tend to pull the hard drive apart. Um, and so the, theoretically, the idea is any any uh, well structured system has this vulnerability. Uh, now Tarski uh, came after Girdle and, and kind of uh, stated it in in a very um, um, uh, specific way, it's called Tarski's undefinability theorem, and that is that uh, arithmetical truth cannot be defined in arithmetic. Uh, so it's it, the, the point is that there is a that there is a reliance upon other things. That whenever we, that the, it, it comes down to whenever we are trying to use deductive reasoning, we think of deductive reasoning as you know this kind of perfect system. However, the axioms that you use in deductive reasoning had to be induced, so therefore it is faulty at its basis and so there is this basic faulty basis you know thing that's going on that, that's also kind of you know going on in the scientific and mathematical you know um circles or they're seeing that they you know with with girdle and with with tarski they're, 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 here we have these proofs that you know rational thought just like kant was saying is it, it has these fundamental flaws and it has this reliance upon things outside of a system and it, and it like i said it, it kind of has to do with that uh this statement is false those those uh paradoxes that end up creating these uh, you know infinite loops and and things of that nature and that's kind of part of the reason why your typical computer can can um, can have these failure points is because you know uh, logic can be broken by using it in certain ways and so so here's the thing is uh, you can take that to say okay that there well there's a there there may be kind of flaws in it or you can take it to the, the wildest extent is like, oh, nothing can be relied upon at all. Is everything, you know, the nothing is necessarily any better than anything else. And that, you know, since, since logic is fundamentally flawed, then why ever use logic? And that's kind of where the postmodernism uh, bent, it went crazy and went wrong and it, it started to tear people's minds apart. So, so here's the thing. So you've got, you know, you've got the, uh, this idea of, of, um, faith and, uh, and and doubt so you you you, can, you have to doubt things to a certain extent but you have to have faith to a certain extent to be able to move forward and you have this this mix of things but the thing is uh, if you start doubting things to the level and to the extent that post postmodernism sort of suggests then at a certain point the probability of anything being true in a hierarchy of truth, in other words, one thing being more true than another, how do you determine what's more probable than another thing? You can't really determine if you no longer have any any greater value on one truth 
over another, then how would you have any greater probability, since your information is fundamentally flawed, you, how are you going to have any greater probability of one thing over another? And what I'm talking about here is the way that, that this philosophy literally tears a mind apart and makes it incapable of working in a certain way. Uh, and so they, so there is, they, they get to the point where once they actually follow uh, Descartes, you know, uh, suggestion that if you would be a real seeker of truth, it is necessary at least once in your life to doubt as far as possible all things. They take that very seriously, but then never return from that point. So you can actually, you can doubt things to the point where it's like, maybe I am really, you know, uh, the, the, everything around me is truly an illusion. There is no real truth. There is no, nothing is greater necessarily than any other. And then they lose the ability to predict anything by based on probability, because probability relies upon a hierarchy of truth. You have to be able to say, this is more true than that thing. And so there is kind of a loss of the whole idea of a future and a past. They, they literally end up being kind of completely in the moment like an animal, and they, they shatter their consciousness into, into pieces that kind of work independently. It's almost like a, like a computer that was once a whole thing that could work as a larger system, and it gets shattered into little pieces that handle all of the little parts, kind of like if you were to, to take the different areas of the brain, you know, you, like for instance, there's the area of the brain that, that deals with logic, though, I mean, not logic, I mean, um, with speech, you have two areas of the brain, uh, Broca's and Wernicke's, and you can actually, uh, and I always get them confused, but you, know, you can you can lesion one of them, you can take one of them out, and a person can understand speech and not be able to produce it. And it's because we do have these specialized brain areas. Well, imagine if instead of them working together in the in perfect concert, they instead were all disjointed and not sending information to each other properly. And, and so you, you could actually see how a person's consciousness could be disjointed and uh, not a, not concerted, but like a cacophony. It's just like if, if, uh, if people are playing instruments, they have to play them in the right timing together for you to have a symphony, but you you just get that timing off, and the exact same notes and, and sequence of events on each of those instruments will end up creating this ugly cacophony. But there's but each each one is still carrying out what it's supposed to do. It's just that they're no longer coordinated. And so I believe that the, this philosophy literally disjoints brains. Um, but so so now let's go back to the um, the special relativity link here. So. One of the first things that uh, that I have a problem with, and I'll, I and I'll like I said before, this has to do with there is a um, interpretation of the data as opposed to a complete um, change of the way that we, uh, you know, instead of just throwing away relativity, there is another way of looking at relativity. There is an interpretation of it. So, so one of the first things that you need to understand about relativity is it does break from mechanics because the first, one of the first things that people say about it, now I'm going to get back to that, but the, the first thing that people say about it is that there is no longer an ether, that there is no longer, when you think of a wave, Okay, so a wave is not a thing that exists on its own. Anywhere else in reality, I mean, you, you can look at anywhere in reality, it is, a wave is simply a compression and refraction. It is a, it is something happening to something else. It's just like going for a run. You can't hold a run in your hand. It's something that happens to a person as they move their legs. Well, a, a wave is something that happens to a medium as it is crushed and then attempts to uh, find equilibrium and goes to the next point, you know, so there's, it is something happening to something else. And so it's suggesting that a wave can exist without a medium is fundamentally irrational. So then there's that point of the irrationality, then the second point, and I'm pointing out these irrationalities, but there is a, a logic I will, I will also show that exists within relativity as well. But these, this is just the topical and uh, modern explanation of relativity that doesn't actually fit even with Einstein's idea of relativity. And I can prove that as well because of his own statements and, a, uh, and some of his own lectures. So the, uh, so the thing is, there is a this idea that, um, that that a wave can exist without a medium. But then in, in addition to that, the other thing that, that we, we have uh, that we're supposed to accept is that if, um, if to say there are two people in space and nothing else in the universe, 
if uh, if they if the two of them were to push off of each other, or let's just start the universe at the point that they're moving away from each other. And so this is the whole universe, these two people looking at each other with no other reference uh, point in, in reality, and they then say, uh, okay, the one can say, you're moving away from me, and then the other one can look back and say, no, you're moving away from me, and I'm stationary. So each one of them argues that they're stationary. And then in relativity, what we believe is that uh, each one of them then ages more slowly than the other. So, uh, so in other words, as as one is moving, they uh, they are they they're aging slower. They, well, they if simultaneously both, age slower than the other at the same right. time. Right. So, and they're both right. Yes. So you can see that this is a fundamental. Uh, th there is a, a fundamental paradox. issue here. There is a paradox. <laughs> well, see, here's the thing. There is a place that this paradox came from. There is a reason this paradox exists, and it is there is a solution which is mechanical and instead of this magical belief set which I have described so far because what I've described is a magical set of beliefs. However, the initial math that Lorentz, Hendrik Lorentz created with the, um, the change factor, he what he created was a system that is entirely mechanical and it is specifically to describe the way that a wave moves in a medium when a subject is moving through that medium that is what the math describes is this odd way that they would have to move through it now it's so all I'll get to that in a second but here here's the thing in 1920 now that, now keep in mind special relativity was 1905 general relativity was 1912 so Einstein had some time to think about what he had written by 1920 he gave a a lecture at the University of Leiden. I think that I'm pronouncing that correctly. Who knows? Uh, and in that lecture, he he extols the virtue and necessity of an ether. He specifically calls it an ether, and he talks about how it is an absolute necessity, because uh, they, 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 one of, I think his quote. Oh, let me. Uh, I'll forget the quote. You can look it up yourself. But he basically says that there will be no uh, no rods or clocks, which is a reference to his initial paper, uh, or any space or anything without this ether. So, so the idea that Einstein eliminated the ether is wrong, but it is what we now have as our narrative about that science, that there, that there is this, uh, that everything is purely relative, that in other words, both these conflicting things can be true in the way in which they solve that is by adding an additional dimension. But uh, there's no reference frame is what you're saying. Right. There is no there's frame. No of universal frame. rigid sort of a system frame. Right. Right. And not only that, there is the inference that there is no necessity for a universal frame of reference. However, the mathematics as they were developed of preferred frame mechanics. That's what they describe is the way that a wave moves in a medium. And so that is what the change factor is. That is what the, the, the rents, um, uh, the Lorentz transform is uh, describing. So, so here's the thing. So we have these beliefs that okay, like, like let me give it an, another example. That if you're on a train uh, traveling the speed of a bullet, and someone is on the ground uh, facing the same direction with a gun, they fire a gun. You look out beside you, you see a bullet traveling beside you as it falls to the ground. Then, uh, but in relativity, then we're going to talk about light. So if you're in a train traveling at or near the speed of light, which theoretically you can't travel at, so we'll just say near, uh, and somebody is facing the same direction, they fire a laser beam. And if you look out your window, you would think that you would see the first wave front of the laser beam very slowly passing you if you're traveling nearly the speed of light, or if you were traveling at the speed of light, if we assume that it was actually possible, then you would see the laser beam traveling right beside you is what you would think. However, according to the current interpretation, uh, what you instead see is the beam passing you at the speed of light still. So that means no matter how fast you go, light is going faster by the same amount, which of course is a non-physical description of reality. It no longer has mechanics to it. However, there is a context in which it does have mechanics where it makes perfect mechanical sense. And that is when we still have Lorentz's uh, idea of preferred frame mechanics. Now, at this point, I have to say that preferred frame mechanics was something that um well it's something that is now uh starting to become come back it's coming people are starting to understand that you need preferred frame mechanics there are numerous um experiments specifically the uh Coudet experiments that are showing that that a uh, that there is a underlying 
Uh, they, they've been calling it the quantum vacuum. There's, a, it's also called uh, quantum superfluid um, uh, or superfluid vacuum theory. There's a, there's a few different ways uh, in which that they are addressing that the, that space behaves as a fluid, and so therefore, it, as a fluid, it would have a preferred frame, just as Einstein was saying. As a matter of fact, Einstein uh, was a fan of Mach. You know, Mach is in like Mach one, Mach two. That's be, that was actually named after Ernst Mach. And uh, and Mach uh, specifically, well, Mach had some problems with with some of the various interpretations of relativity, and he actually called um, science a church that he wanted nothing to do with. Uh, but uh, Einstein, he he was actually he he uh, he looked up to him, and he and so his one of Mach's ideas is that the universe its preferred frame would be uh, based upon the average gravitation of uh, all the different bodies in the universe. So therefore, in other words, this is a preferred frame. Once again, uh, not, not, no, in other words, relativity, the whole principle that everything's that, that one thing in, is relative to another goes away. Once you have a preferred frame, then of course we have the cosmic microwave background, which also uh, presents a preferred frame. So the, the idea of a preferred frame has been there and is, is uh, not even, it's not even controversial that there are these things that that are um, you know uh, ideas of a preferred frame that are accepted science however somehow philosophically the general group of people still um, do not accept that preferred fra frame mechanics are ne necessary why do they not uh, why do they not like that because it 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 controverts the magical aspects that have snuck into science. It is it controverts those magical beliefs that allowed us to still believe in some wooish bullshit. Uh, and so, whenever we the people hate determinism, they absolutely fucking hate it. Uh, it it is there is a there is this deep. Uh, seated, you know, uh, yucky feeling that people get that they feel like a puppet or whatever whenever we're talking about determinism. And so human beings in general love their magic and they keep returning to it. And uh, and the postmodernism plays upon that. They uh, love their illusion of being in control. Okay, so 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 for let's let's set that aside for a minute and let's get to quantum uh, mechanics. So. With relativity theory, I, I, you know, I feel like maybe I should explain a little bit more of how Lorentz's theory uh, does it. But basically, Lorentz's theory it describes that. Uh, let me let me let me give this train example. So, if inside the train um, you have this ability to, let's say, you have some sort of gun that can slow time. If I were to slow time inside the train, what everything that was happening inside there would be. Um, uh, you would you, you would experience it normally, and if you couldn't see outside, you would think that you were experiencing the same time as everybody else, because we've shot you with the magical time beam. And uh, and so even though you're doing things slowly, the outside world, if you looked out, and now here's the important part, it would occur extremely fast to you. In other words, when you looked out your window, however much your time is slowed, everything else's time is sped up, and so things are happening very quickly quickly outside of you now this is the is the com commutative factor of that was in that was part of Lorentz's theory so so that means that if I were to say for instance slow your time enough that if the, the that if the beam that uh, like rem remember I said you couldn't travel at the speed of light that's part of the that one of the reasons why that's an axiom is because if if so long as you're traveling just a little below the speed of light then that beam is passing you I can slow your time enough to make that beam pass you at the speed of light that's what the math does however but there's a couple of things that you should be able to notice here and that is that it that it only has one way in it in other words it, it will only work in one direction it won't work in two directions and the other is that it does require that that if there's one subject that is sped up when he looks back at the or is one subject that is slowed down when he looks back at the other subject he is sped up and that is what was removed from Lorentz and uh, and put into special relativity the reason why that that was removed was specifically they used kind of a they used the rules of science against science and one of those rules is kind of an occam's razor thing that if you are to um if you you should only use those things which you can first of all that you you can actually test and then anything that is beyond that should be removed anything that, that any ideas beyond that so here's the thing so say for instance you scientifically uh, or you're not allowed behind the curtain watching a an illusionist 
And uh, and so therefore, and then you were tasked with scientifically describing this fella putting a, a, um, a spear through his chest. You are not allowed by the rules of science to describe what is the say for instance you happen to know mechanically that there's only one way that the that this illusion could actually be created and so you describe those mechanics that's what Lorenz was doing he was describing what was under the surface but could not necessarily be seen at the time and so we, he did that mathematically. But the thing is, then if you come back with science and say, well, you can't do that. You can't, it's not, you didn't, you didn't specifically see those mechanics underneath the surface. Uh, and so therefore describing that they are there is, is, uh, is, is non-rational. It's not, uh, it's not part of science. Well, of course it is rational because of course the guy can't put a spear through his chest and live. There are certain things, there are certain constraints that, that, that we can, uh, that we can determine that there are, uh, so anyway, the, the, the point is that that is what was happening with special relativity is that they were that they were able to remove that aspect and say you can't describe the underlying um, uh, the, the underlying mechanism. So therefore, you have to just pick this the the, the topical what you see on, on this in this topical region. So it and, looks like what ended up happening is that you had something that was going uh, on the very extremes of modernism, which is if you can't directly observe it, if you can't see that very materialistic sort of thing in front of you, you can't measure it, you can't do anything about it. And uh, that basically made them throw out something that made things rational and it became postmodernist. Right. And so, so the thing is, in Lorentz's theory, there is a preferred frame. And, and the thing is that the math is exactly the same as special relativity, but there is a preferred frame. But the, the problem with that is that with that technology of the time, there was no way to find the, the preferred frame. Now, that is different from it being impossible to find the preferred frame. It just simply means it is extremely difficult and we, and did, not, we did not possess the technology to do so. And to this day, there has never been a one-way speed of light test. It is always two-way. So there, is no, there has never been a scientific uh, way by which we have determined whether or not the the Lorentz's original idea of a preferred but hidden frame uh, is accurate versus the idea which kind of grew off of relativity and is said to be relativity but isn't actually Einstein's idea of relativity and that is that there isn't a preferred frame that there, that everything is relative. But so they took uh, you know what uh, Einstein basically and by 1920 he was already like oh yeah shit let's bring that preferred frame back but it already kind of uh, took off and had a life of its own uh, and, and it became a way to make things relative and keep things relative. Right. And I think he and understood from the happen. beginning that there had to kind of be a preferred frame, but that he felt it was, if you look at his writings, he just felt it was not necessary to really talk about it. But then what you end up finding is that the twins paradox, uh, you know, where, you, as we described earlier, that, you know, whoever, whoever is moving away from the other is the one that's going slower and the, uh, uh, that is uh, aging slower. And there's a million different ways in which they, uh, they say, oh, well, there was the turnaround or it was the acceleration or it's the one way or another they come back to defining a preferred frame and then pretend, pretending that they did not define a preferred frame uh, but they did in each case uh, in each solution of the, the twins paradox but then even beyond the twins paradox there's something uh, called the relativity of simultaneity so um, you know I should have probably brought up the this video but basically the relativity of simultaneity means that if I were to have if there was a a, uh, a little uh, guy on a bicycle, a little alien on a bicycle, just like, uh, you know, millions of light years away. And, uh, and if he were moving uh, forward towards me on his bicycle, moving very slowly, basically, his instant moment would actually be lined up with, well, I get confused whether it's the future or the past, but the point is that he, his instantaneous moment would be lined up with, uh, with the past or the future of uh, whether he's going f towards us or away from us and by hundreds of years. But the, the problem with this is that where he lines up on the whole slice, uh, on the whole loaf, there's actually, I'm, I'm thinking of a specific visualization that if I, I wish you could, uh, could bring it up for me. Um, let me see if I can find the link. Uh, you know, that's going to take too long. But the point is that there, that there is this idea that, you know, his time would swing into the future or the past based upon 
how much he was going towards me or away from me, because that is a consequence, a rational consequence of taking relativity and interpreting it the way that they were interpreting it, which, by the way, was influenced by Minkowski, which was uh, Einstein's mentor. Um, and so, th th but the problem with this is that there is a arbitrary placement on this future and past that cannot be rationally decided. In other words, if he swings into the, my future, my past, because when we're not moving, we're in, at the same moment, how do you determine that when we're not moving, we're at the same moment? You really can't because if everything is relative and you don't have a preferred frame, then there's then there are many ways in which his instantaneous moment is it's undefined. So therefore, it could be anywhere. So Therefore, you literally have to have, that's part of the reason why you have to have this idea of a fourth dimension, because yeah, you, to solve these paradoxes, you have to have multiple versions of, multiple conflicting versions of reality. And so that then leads to um, some of the aspects of um, quantum mechanics. So the second point at which it really, really starts to fly apart is, okay, so so some of the uh, the ideas of special relativity led to ideas in quantum mechanics. So, the, so we, there's a, a kind of a breakdown that started to happen in two different places. And in quantum mechanics, oh, yes, hold on. Uh, let me look that up. Okay. So anyhow, in... Um, in quantum mechanics, you have the. Uh, I'm, I'm getting a note here that, that that I'm getting too technical, so so I'm gonna have to uh, you know wrap it up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> the in quantum mechanics, there is the idea that uh, that instead of the undefinability, the 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 fuzzy nature of what we observe being a problem with our instrumentation and with our method of observing, that the problem is that reality itself is fuzzy and that our interaction with it is what defines it. And this, once again, is an interpretation. It is uh, that there, because there is another valid interpretation based upon fluid mechanics, which once again also um, it, it supports a uh, a preferred frame because if there is a if there is a medium that is uh, in a or a quantum vacuum or however however you want to term it basically it's just another word for the ether then th then that is a preferred frame and that is it, it's going to uh, I'm trying to make this too short and so it's it's uh, it's kind of making it difficult to explain the um, the point is that we have these ideas in quantum mechanics that where we believe that uh, that that reality isn't it isn't there until we we interact with it mentally. And the truth of the matter is, there's an interpretation called pilot wave, and there's a great video that recently came out by Veritasium, and um, and in in it he points out the way in which uh, we now have macro level experiments that completely undermine all of the reasoning uh, that we use to come up with these ideas that our, our consciousness in, in, in impacted things and that we're that that at the lowest level everything is probability which is just a fuzzy concept and that there isn't that determinism isn't real so i mean you know, i'm sure you've heard determinism is is broken there's no there is no determinism that's been disproven etc 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 that is not actually correct at all there is a alternative version of quantum mechanics based upon fluid mechanics and uh and the cude experiments prove that the whole reason why we're we were even saying that things were fuzzy at that that lower level was because we did not understand certain complex mechanics which we now do understand so there is a deterministic way of viewing the entire universe that where there is zero magic in it and it's just that the, 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 my point is is that uh, we have these things that theoretically support the postmodernist ideas that everything is relative, that we make reality by thinking about it. All of these ideas that are that support that viewpoint, um, they're holding on to them because they have these postmodernist ideas. And when, but the truth of the matter is, there is a completely deterministic and mechanical explanation of exactly the same phenomena, exactly the same uh, data and events. And it is instead completely deterministic, completely rational, and uh, but and, and completely, you know, it, it does have a hierarchy of truth. It does have, it, there are certain things, there are, there is cause and effect. It isn't all fuzzy. There is a reality. Uh, that's, and, uh, so that's uh, that's as much as I can shorten it up and wind it up. 
Well, that's, I mean, uh, that's sort of actually uh, what I want to talk about as well, because we're, we're saying here, it's easy to look at uh, the fringes of the radical feminists that are saying you can't be a fluid mechanics person unless you bleed out of your vagina and that, you know, we need to dismantle science because somebody in a village in Africa can send a lightning bolt to kill someone else and science can't explain that. So, uh, so much wrong there. But uh, it's easy to make fun of the uh, liberal colleges and, you know, how they attack reason and all that. But what I want to talk about, and this may make you guys feel uncomfortable because you feel like you're um, rigid scientific ivory tower of physics is uh, immune from this sort of thing, but we are actually in the throes of extremely postmodernist and irrational uh, and solipsistic attitudes in science. And specifically, uh, you know, as you were talking about quantum physics, that I, I'd like you to talk more about that because we're talking about. Uh, where scientists are saying that we are we as humans are aging the universe by observing it you know like we're we're so into the idea of human mind observing something creates it that that's like where science is now and it's like that's yeah i mean it's, that, that is the accept accepted science now uh, is dominated by the idea that uh, that the that spooky action at a distance and here's the thing the funny thing is uh, einstein was against the spooky action at a distance and and it, you know people are going to be like people who know about this unfortunately there there are it, it, the more you know about the subject, the more it it uh, it it curates the trajectory of your thoughts, and so it it, it makes it basically makes you you know kind of you think yourself into a corner because the, the we've got all of these ideas that we've we've used to explain this this magical view of things, and then we don't have an alternative explanation that's uh, readily and easily available. Like there are uh, there are certain aspects of the. I mean, even Einstein, like on his deathbed, said, "Okay, maybe I was wrong, and you know, uh, everything is is fucking crazy, and, uh, and spooky action at a distance happens, and yada yada." But the thing is, if you simply remove the idea that um, that particles. Are um, are entirely like these self-contained objects, and uh, then once you start to uh, have them be uh, part of like a continuum, uh, which is something that's explained. There's there's a paper on this by um, let's see, uh, it's a Ross Anderson and. Um, uh, the, the, there's a there's a group at Cambridge who's who's done some papers on the idea of particles being um, they call them um, sonons, and uh, the the idea is that it it is there is a continuum instead of there being a hard border just like a tornado um, has it, it, you know is is not a hard border but it does it, it appears to be one uh, or like you can sit there and and have one person believe that there are two clouds and another person believe there's only one cloud because the the border is not actually hard and you're just arbitrarily adding a, a border uh, because that you're because of some sort of perception i mean okay like for instance the 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 border on a tornado is not not necessarily arbitrary, but in one way, but it is in another. And that is specifically that it has to do with the density of the air uh, mediates the um, the relative humidity and the density of the air is is, uh, is changed by the rotation of the uh, of the um, of the cloud. And so therefore it creates this borderline that's related to something real in reality. It's a real transition point. But the borderline itself, itself, if you were to get right on it, it's not it's it, it, it doesn't really have a whole lot to do with the tornado. There's just the, the wind speed just outside of the border and just inside of the border is pretty much the same. And the tornado is still, you know, tearing shit apart outside of that funnel cloud. But we can see the the, the border line and, and it represents this transition point between water vapor and uh, and then becoming droplets because of the relative humidity. But uh, and so that 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 kind of fuzziness exists in, in quantum mechanics as well. If you start to see things as okay, so in quantum mechanics you can create you can treat mechanical waves in a medium as phonons okay and so what a phonon is it's a virtual particle and that what that means is that it is bullshit it's, in it's other words it is a virtual particle right it, it means it oh. is well <laughs> here's the thing it makes I mean, I it is a useful it's a useful right. mathematical construct it is useful in other yes, words it's but, just like gallons are useful i agree but also i'm getting triggered by the dark 
matter and dark energy because earlier we're talking about if you can't measure something uh you know you can't talk about it well <laughs> <Just triggered. laughs> yeah exactly uh, because we we have these uh and, and of course you have the the gluons and poopons and fly ons and muons and poo-ons and gruons and that on <laughs> and so like, on uh so. so many different particles that well, are not substantiated by anything other than flimsy math which is based on something that is uh postmodern. Well, well basically they don't understand that that there is an interpretive aspect to their math uh so here's the thing so like, as i was saying the phonons are a mathematical treatment of waves which are continuous in a medium and they but the, the thing is they do they are actually actually related just like the tornado has that false border that we see that is related to something else which is the transition point of water vapor into into uh into droplets the same thing is true in whenever we're using phonons in a crystalline lattice is that there it is actually th those those individual units that we're using they're somewhat arbitrary but not entirely they're actually related to transitional uh points and so it has to do with the way that the lattice vibrates and and so it is useful to have these uh, phonons uh, and it is a quantum mechanical it is it's basically it relies on the, all the same quantum mechanical properties that there are these particles moving around but the, the truth of the matter is when we get down to it those particles are imaginary they're not really there and this is just a well-known part of all the way we use phonons well here's the thing that same thing can be true of all these other particles as well is that we are we are placing arbitrary ideas of borderlines on them that but because they are actually related to something but that doesn't mean that they are real particles and so they so once you get into a fluid mechanics um explanation of quantum mechanics uh which they are interchangeable this is uh there's the wigner whale uh transformation it's you can go look it up but the the point is that it uh, you can then look at these experiments that supposedly prove this uh, this uh, spooky action at a distance, and and then once you simply say, okay, they're not actually particles, but they are these they are waves, and uh, and the, with waves with certain properties that have to do with transition points, then you can understand how this apparent spooky action at a distance isn't an action at all. And in fact, the idea that it's an action just comes from our expectations of the fuzziness. In other words, like the Copenhagen interpretation, specifically what they're saying when they think that this, that you, you modify, the way the story is told whenever you're just looking at it topically is that, oh, you modify one particle here and then no matter how far away the other one is because it's joined in some other dimension or some other spooky magical bullshit, uh, and no matter how far away it is, it instantaneously moves. Uh, and that is not that is a complete misrepresentation of what it is that they're actually seeing and that is that they believe that it goes from the quantum fuzzy multiple places at once state into a single place a single reality because of observation and then that observation that collapse of all the probabilities of where it could be is actually turned into one place that it really is so that's what they that they what they believe then the thing is, if you can then take the information about this, just like a two, after two billiard balls interact with each other and they're at a distance from each other, you can look at one billiard ball. If you knew the point at which they interacted and the, you could know this and you know the spin of it and you know all the other things about it, well then, even if you don't see the other billiard ball, you can know certain things about it. The same thing is true of particles. But the thing is, there are all they, because they believe there are all these possibilities and that the particle actually exists as possibilities and not as something real because they believe it exists as that they then think that once you know something about it at a distance because you you can interpret it from the particle that you have like you know that you're looking at that you're testing because that you can know something about it then it goes from the fuzzy possibility existence into the real existence and so you changed the particle at a distance well nothing's changed at a distance your knowledge of it has changed and so that is they use these these magical ideas and that is the accepted copenhagen interpretation is the accepted now version and the reason why it's accepted is because it supports the postmodernist ideology it is that ideology 
is it's in science and it's gotten in there where people want to believe in this magical bullshit, but it's it's completely not is it not necessary. There is tremendous overwhelming overwhelming evidence that all of our reasons for ever having believed any of this stupid shit in the first place are easily the, the 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 proof against it is easily found and there is alternative there's there is rational better mechanical you know when you look at the the when you use occam's razor and say is this magical bullshit uh, the better explanation or is this other explanation that's completely mechanical the one that we should go with well the the one that is the the you know that's completely mechanical is the one we should fucking go with uh, but instead because of postmodernism because that philosophy is deeply ingrained and because people hate determinism and because people want to believe in magic there is a sociological thing going on that makes us continue to believe in copenhagen interpretation instead of pilot wave now other people are going to say i'm oversimplifying in the, the, there's all these other things and yes of course i'm oversimplifying it because i'm not saying that but you know. they are saying that you are confusing to um i'm not sure what is going on here but apparently bell experiment and the single slit experiment is something yes that bell, you bell's inequalities and in, 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 in the thing is bell's inequalities works just fine with waves there is there is no problem if it's a wave phenomena. Period. Uh, it, I don't want to go into uh, there's you know there's problems with the way that polarization is conceived that I that I'd have to I've done lectures on. The, I know the, about that. <laughs> right. The way the polar polarization is conceived of ba is based upon a purely a real billiard ball particle type of perspective. And but when you then when you instead look at it from a purely wave based perspective, it changes the, the expectation. There is no longer a linear expectation, but there is the um, the wave expectation that we see in the results of the, uh, the, the Bell test. So there are a variety of things. Yes, there is a tremendous amount of explanation I would have to do. And that's what I'm, I'm, I'm working on a book because there's no right. way that I can I, this is this fills numerous books but these I'm not alone in this there are people at Cambridge there are people at MIT there there is a shift that going on in the physics community right now but we're still having to we're banging up against that love of magic and that is what I uh, am wanting to point out is that the that, that this magic is also proof for postmodernism is post uh, it's pr proof for all of these ideologies when there is a completely deterministic explanation that is workable and uh, and so that's that's just what I wanted to put out there and and yes of course there's going to be controversy of course there's going to be arguments about it because there's there's a lot of different explanations having to do with the bell inequalities there's a lot of uh, things having to do with the, the spooky action at a distance there's a lot of things you know I, I didn't even get into how the Michelson Morley experiment was actually not null uh, you know that <laughs> there are so many different things we could get into here and I just I would be going on and on and on forever if I explained down each one of those paths but I'm willing to you know do them one at a time in comments, etc. But the the thing is, the point is that I can tell you about it if you want if you want to know about it, and just consider the possibility that what I'm saying is true, and examine it yourself from that perspective. You don't have to accept what I'm saying. You can just look at it and say, is there the, these other things? Is there a rational, deterministic explanation that is an alternative to our current ideas? And are those current ideas magical? And is there a reason why we would be hanging on to magic? That's all I've got to say on that, though. Yeah, so please leave a comment if you'd like more um, clarification or explanation, or if you have particular concerns um, that he may be gracious enough to address. <clears throat> but I mean, going back to the the quantum bit, uh, as uh, the entanglement, isn't that the? I'm not I'm not sure on this, but isn't that the base for quantum computing? <sighs> And that's one of the things that Ross Anderson has written papers on as well. At right, that's why they won't let it go because it's, it's like they're, they're uh, yes, quantum really. okay, quantum computing is two things. It's bullshit first off, but it's also another thing, and that is uh, analog computing. Okay, so whenever the here's the thing: when do you when you say I want magic to be done as a person who is the funder and who doesn't understand things at a, at, a, at the engineering level, you tell your engineers make it happen. Then what the engineers do is they say, oh fuck, that is irrational, it doesn't work, but I'm trying to read into what you're saying and trying to create something that'll actually fucking work. So here's the thing, quantum computing will actually end up working, but what it will be is analog computing. It'll actually be an analog digital hybridization. And that has actually been done before. There's very few labs, but that is the only thing that will really actually work because it has to do with wave addition. And that is a real scientific way of, uh, of, of doing things. But the idea of quantum computing, where you go into all these uh, uh, extra dimensions and get extra power, you know, computing power because you're, you have infinite dimensions 
a, it's bullshit. It's complete bullshit, and it's untenable on a variety of levels. And it, the, the, and <laughs> that is something. Like I said, the, this the, Ross Anderson is the. Um, uh, at Cambridge, he's the uh, what's it called the um, crypto uh, cryptographics. I don't know. He's he's basically the head of of um, of computer um, uh, security there at Cambridge, and uh, and he's basically come out numerous times saying this is this is nonsense. It just won't work. And there's no rational basis for it. And the thing is, people will they, they don't understand that their beliefs that something should work are based upon prior knowledge, which was the whole that was the whole point of this this entire thing. That is the good aspect of uh, of postmodernism is you have to be able to recognize the basis of a belief and then follow that basis back and doubt it, and then follow that basis back and doubt it. And you have to be able to go a, a long way back. But the thing is, when do you do that? Because if you are constantly going back and doubting everything that you've ever been taught, then you never get anything done. And so it is a necessity of those people who produce and those people who actually progress to rely upon faith. You have to, you can't spend your whole life retesting everything. That is, and, and, but there are a few people who need to be able to do that, who need to be able to go back and doubt the basis of all of those things which look to be rational and which look to, to, to work. And that is what I have done, is that I've taken that doubt uh, a, a long way back. But that is not what absolutely everybody has the time to do, and because it's a tremendous amount of effort, it's a tremendous amount of uh, investment of time and energy that may be completely fucking worthless and because we need to be able to progress you need to be able to you can't go into a school and call into to question absolutely everything that you're learning before you learn it how the fuck are you going to learn anything you can't you have to take their word for it so you can get to the next concept so you can build a large structure of concepts that works together that's the necessity of learning is faith and so i uh, so the thing is yes there will be Lots of people who are working on things that, and they do work. There's a good reason why they continue to use the current mechanics because they work. Okay, they're, they're, but the thing is, there is a greater level of understanding that can be given by having uh, a, be a better set of mechanics. And this is a, a much longer explanation that I have to get into. But, but it's the difference between the intellect of a human and the intellect of a computer is understanding, and it, it governs the trajectory of your investigation. In other words, why was it if, if quantum mechanics works right now, why the fuck do we care if there's another version of it? Why does it even matter? Who cares? Well, who cares is that invention relies upon accurately predicting as far as possible into the future. That is what it actually, that's what understanding is, is the nature of understanding requires that you have an accurate model of reality. And so if you know all the steps in between, you can then predict further into the future because that's how mechanics work. That's how you build, uh, uh, you know, impressive machines is because you know that each part can be relied upon and can go into the future. So the thing is, why is this important is because we have to have a greater understanding to be able to invent more. And so it is that is part of science is also going back, not just finding what works, but finding something that also predicts better. And so that that is also, you know, that's a that's kind of a philosophy thing. And, uh, you know, people are going to, you know, even question that. I don't know how they do, but they, they do question that specific thing. But the point is, it's the difference between computer intellect and, you know, an actual human intellect, you, because a computer can calculate uh, much faster, it can memorize better. But what is it that makes us better than computers at understanding things? And it's our, our capacity for analogy and our capacity for for looking and better, creating better analogies, better um, models models of things so that we can predict. It is prognostication that makes our intellect superior. So anyhow, um, it, was that's there anything really, else? Yeah, that's a really good wrap up though, because that's the whole issue with, uh, you know, postmodernism. And, you know, it's like, the question is, how, how do we, well, first of all, why does it matter? Well, because of that, because, uh, yeah, you know, it is just as equal when you have water boiling in a microwave at a certain temperature, a certain latitude it is, or altitude. It is just as equal as the god of water boiling it on one level, but on the other one it isn't. Because if you think that it's the god of water, you're going to be praying to the gods and your water is going to be cold. It's not going to fucking happen. Or, or the, well, you think that the way that you that you pray to the gods is by putting it in the microwave. And so there's all these these levels of misunderstanding that you can add there to make it seem like they are the same. And you can make the, the knowledge seem to be the exact same. And it's not because there are other uses of water that rely upon understanding boiling better and so that is that that is my point is that, is that there are better understandings there is a hierarchy of knowledge there is one set of knowledge is superior to another and that is that that is what 
postmodernism tears down. And that's why we have shut up and calculate as part of uh, modern physics, by the way. They, they, they sit there and tell you, well, it works. You don't need to understand it better. It doesn't matter if you understand it. You just shut up and calculate because it works. No, that is what reduces a, a human intellect down to a computer intellect. You become a cog, not a fucking human. So, so my point is, yes, you have to be able to understand. You There, there is a, a hierarchy of knowledge. There is a hierarchy of understanding. And the god of boiling water and having a magical belief about the way that the reality works, th those things don't work. You can't then predict the future. You can't invent as well. You can invent to a certain extent, but you can't invent as well. And so we're talking about a superiority of usefulness. Exactly. And, uh, and I think if we continue down the path of, you know, especially with physics, um, because I think other sciences have a bit of humility, but um, ever since the um, physics became basically postmodernist, uh, they kind of have no humility at all because it is a bit, it, it is a religion at that point. Um, just like with feminism. You know what? That's one of the things I hate is that actually the people who are in quantum mechanics are more open-minded and they're, they're going to be the first ones to change. And it's actually people in relativistic um, mechanics right. that are far more pedantic and are not going to change nearly as quickly or, and they're not going to recognize their errors nearly as well as the people in quantum mechanics. But in quantum mechanics is also where the most irrational shit is too. So it's like, oh, God damn it. Well, that, that's the thing. Basically what I'm looking for is uh, a way for science, the one that does, the, the more rigid it is, the more it needs that postmodernist drop just a drop of hey uh you know doubt your assumptions uh always to, you know yeah have a workable theory in the best that we got right now but remember that it's always still through the veil of weird senses and weird interpretations and you know don't ever think that it's dogma because that's yeah. when it's science Girdle and Tarski had a point that's it <laughs> figure out that what that point is and follow it I'm not sure I'm following, actually. Oh, well, Gerdell and, and Tarski, they were basically saying that, that that there is a failure point to logic, and that failure point to logic specifically is, you know, like I was saying, that deductive reasoning is the axioms that you use in deductive re reasoning are reliant upon the inductive reasoning that you did just beforehand. And so there's this interplay of inductive and deductive reasoning, and, uh, and that's not immediately obvious to most people. And that is kind of what was being pointed out by Gerdell and uh, Gerdell and, uh, God, I hate that name, uh, Gerdell and Tarski. I see. Uh, well, yeah, but I'm just trying to get back to the postmodernist bit and be like, well, how do we fix it? You know, but that's ultimately is how do we, what do we do? You know, uh, we know how we got here, but, but what do we do now? And, uh, you know, I think, uh, one thing that we have already been doing, which is uh, try to show the scientific community that, um, you know, they have a big old blind spot and that they're taking themselves uh, a little too re religiously, a little too seriously. And, um, you know, we, we, I don't think we can ever fix a postmodernist problem uh, at its core because, it, you know, people will uh, be solipsistic, they will doubt reality, they will not have a connection to reality. And I mean, I'm talking about postmodernism in its most extreme sense. You know, what we're talking about is the necessity of rebellion. We have to have rebellion. We have to have the opposing force. And it's just we have to be able to keep, keep it under control, just like we need structure, but we have to keep it under control. And, exactly. and just knowing that both structure and that rebellion both have their role, and, uh, and sometimes they're going to they're gonna go off the rails. Both of them are. Yes, and I think that that by itself is the one single piece of knowledge that people need to know uh, on one hand to not freak out so much about when the wave goes the other direction because you know there will be a backlash. It will come back in your direction. Um, and uh, and maybe this will have some, you know, um, element of, uh, give people an element of understanding of each other and we need both sides to be open to the other side. We, we understand modernists, we understand postmodernists. <laughs> like we understand that there's people who wanna keep structures and to search for the truth, but you also have to be aware of your own fallibility and that the search you, that the truth you search for may be based on assumptions that are wrong because you're wrong and that's okay. But on the other hand, when you have the other group of people, it's like there are truths that are objective. There are two genders. There are differences between, you know, uh, sexes biologically. Like these things are true. Um, but, you know, you need to remember not to be completely crazy, postmodernists, but you also got to remember not to be completely rigid and, you know, in a certain way, stupid uh, modernists, you know, so there, there needs to be an interplay between the two. And we also need to realize that it is an important thing to have both. And so when you see people embodying the extreme of one or the other, it's just what, what 
it is. It's what reality's got to do. <laughs> it is what it is. It's going to happen. Uh, the, the funny thing is, there's uh, you know the the perfectionism that leads to where it's that 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 extremity of that particular side. It's funny, but one of the things I've been wanting to uh, discuss more is how creativity in the brain is actually based upon serendipity, and uh, and it's kind of borne out a little bit in uh, let's see what was the name of that book. It was. Um, uh, they, they bring it up in, in Ghosts in the Shell. And they talk about it and they call it a, uh, a copy without, without an original. Uh, but it's uh, that's originally from uh, the sim Simulacra and s s uh, Simulation. I think that's the name of the book. And uh, and uh, I, I plan on reading it, but I know some of the concepts and the you know, synopsis of it to a certain extent. But it, it's basically along those same lines. Cool. Uh, oh, wow. that cr basically the creativity relies upon uh, mistakes. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. <laughs> Uh, what you did earlier, but uh, just for those who aren't following, perhaps um, all that closely, um, yeah. So if you if you are curious about the concept of creativity being based on mistakes, go check out that book, and we might do a show on it. Who knows? I'm not really sure what we're doing next month. Um, it'll come to us as we uh, talk about topics and such. But if you'd like to support the show, you want to see more of it, most certainly pledge to my patron, which is patreon.com slash Anna Cherry. Uh, the more patrons we get, the more often we can do these shows. Um, it could be twice a month. Uh, it could be every week. Depends on you guys. Uh, there is even a uh, call-in show um, milestone that is available. So lots of Cherry Stem related uh, thingies on Patreon. And of course, if you'd like to support the larger platform of the Honey Badgers, uh, that's patreon.com slash honeybadgerradio uh, or feedthebadger.com. You know about all that, I'm sure, already. And uh, I'm going to thank us for being here. <laughs> I'm going to thank our volunteers, uh, Richard Rall and Anna Cherry, for being here and uh, giving us an awesome show. Um, and uh, definitely leave your comments and suggestions for uh, future shows if you're a patron. You can do that. But definitely leave your comments and uh, ask questions, and we'll do our best to answer them. And uh, that's all we've got for you guys today. And check out the links uh, that I've posted down below. Right before we go, though, I'd like to ask uh, Richard Rawls, since there was a question in chat, uh, if uh, people want to know more about the kind of things you talk about, about the physics community and things like that, where can they find uh, sources uh, of yours? Okay, uh, on Quora, um, that's you know what I'm gonna. Have, we'll, what we'll do is we'll just put some links in the uh, in the low bar that for some explanations that go along the same lines. And uh, like one of the one of the videos right off the bat, I think it's it was only a few days ago, or maybe it was I guess it was about a week or two ago that um, Veritasium put out the the thing on Pilot Wave. I highly recommend you look into that because it's a, a you know he's he he makes sure to put lots of equivocations in there because it's not been accepted by the larger community, but uh, but it does talk about how uh, all of the phenomena Phenomena that were was spooky and weird uh, does relate to um, uh, this this uh, this set of um, experiments. That, uh, but uh, beyond that, yeah, we'll just put some links to different papers, and um, uh, I recommend looking at the uh, quantum hydrodynamics uh, analog uh, at on MIT. That's uh, that's John Bush's website. Uh, he has a lot of great info there. There's a, um, a, a an interview that he has a, a link to there that, that where he explains things really well. Uh, for the quantum mechanics side, on the uh, on the relativity side, that's um, uh, that's a difficult one because it's there, there is uh, there's really not much dissent because they don't have alternative you know you know in quantum mechanics you have alternative interpretations they understand that data can be interpreted in a variety of ways that's just part of you know quantum mechanics at its heart has these variety of interpretations everybody knows that however they don't know that in, in relativity theory and so there is no people don't understand that you can interpret the data differently when they're specialists in that field. They're a little more rigid. They think there's only one interpretation. So um, that, I'm, uh, like I said, I'm going to have to give you some some links on Quora, et cetera, to, to read a little bit about that. I've got, um, there's a, there's an explanation of relativity that gets down to what separates Lorentz from uh, Einstein's version. I, and it's it's called Einstein's version when in truth it's, it's actually a modern version. It's not even necessarily uh, completely Einstein's version, but uh, it gets into some of the, the that and explains it with some drawings, et cetera. Cool. Uh, well, I was actually uh, looking to see if there's anything uh, for people who may not want to necessarily look at all the different sources uh, right off the bat, but may want to have some sort of introductory or a summary from you of these things. Is there anything like that available or will be available at any point? Well, okay. I, I can mention that there is another um, uh, project I'm doing that is um, 
you know, uh, <laughs> it's kind of hard to describe, but basically I, I've been doing something for a while, which is I'm attempting to create a bridge between those people who, who are more spiritually minded and those people who are more mechanically minded. Uh, and I've written a paper uh, and, um, and I've done, I've made a series that's basically edutainment. And, uh, and I'm relying upon a variety of, of wild and wooish type of beliefs and uh, that, that um, uh, and I'm, I'm basically casting them in the mold of, uh, of science and it basically it should be palatable to those who have both spiritual beliefs and scientific beliefs but uh, but those people who are extremely scientific are going to find it unpalatable to a certain extent because of course there is a reliance upon things that are that are um, you know kind of out there but if they understand the intent is to kind of um, uh, bring determinism to spirituality that they can kind of see where I'm going with it. And, and the name of that series is 3S. And uh, I can put a link to that. And it's just a, three videos on it so far. And uh, and so, like I said, it's kind of a, I'm, I'm attempting to speak in spirituality terms and uh, in the signs and symbols that are part of that language and uh, in, in describing reality in a way that is scientific but fits with the spirituality community's set of beliefs so uh that will kind of get into some of those subjects to a certain extent as well and so it'll kind of um explain a little bit there uh, that sounds awesome um so yeah i i guess that's all we got for you guys today and uh, we will see you all next month and definitely make sure to subscribe uh leave a comment and uh go check out patreon.com slash and I will see you guys next month. Bye-bye now.